don't talk about microservices and actually have to touch. Does anybody know what's in the screen behind me? What do you have to say? Microservices and actually have to touch. Does anybody know what's in the screen behind me? What do you have to say? Control room? Yeah. My idea is to shout. Could be, yeah. Could be, yeah. What happens when you see something happen in the streets and you want to call your best friend the police? It's not really that old. Come on, do me. The steam is submerging. The submerging in the day, uh, which is fairly nice looking. Uh, uh, police and those and uh, fire brigade over the post here. So, my name is Bertrand Schrijver. I work at JPoint, which is a small job consulting uh, shop in Utrecht. Uh, so, I work at Open Value, which is a um, small company that does consulting on different community and DevOps. Basically, anything that helps uh, clients to get better software faster. My current assignment is at the Business Companies, which I'm currently talking about. And um, I run the ML Joke, which is Java user group. Any of you familiar with the ML Joke? Got some work to do, I see. <laughs> the ML Joke has around 4,000 members, 50 business partners. We organize three conferences each year uh, IT Tech Day, J Call, and J Spring. We publish the Java magazine, which is a print magazine about Java uh, six times a year. Membership is very cheap, and you get the maximum profits. So what's next? Uh, I'll start with introducing the situation of my, my talk. Uh, I'll talk a bit about um, the methodology we use in the culture. The architecture and the platform we run on. <coughs> <It's about framework. coughs> front end and back end uh, too. Uh, how we handle development and uh, testing. <coughs> what we use for build tools. For deployments and monitoring our operation. And I'll end with the challenges we face and uh, looking ahead and stuff we still like to do. So, although the talk is titled Microservice in Action, it's not all about microservices, because as you might know, uh, there are all, all, a lot of topics surrounding microservices in terms of, of culture and, and energy. So, I kind of want to give you the entire picture of how we work, how we work this way. Uh, all of course talking about the Microsoft. So, um, has any of you ever heard of the Dutch Police? <laughs> is any of you familiar with the Dutch Police? <laughs> One way. <Yeah. coughs> I'll uh, do the uh, exercise here. The Dutch Police is a fairly large organization, uh, somewhere around um, uh, 16, 65k uh, people. And the IT department is around 1,500 people, so it's a, it's a very large IT department. <coughs> I look at the product line Cloud Big Data Internet, which is a, um, uh, a separate organization within the police, kind of a, um, a department within the police, where uh, uh, three DevOps teams are uh, building um, big data web applications hosted in a private cloud farm. And we do uh, everything ourselves, so it's from um, uh, uh, platform development, uh, testing, uh, maintenance, and management. So we're all, all this in our own group. And I'm going to be uh, talking about how we work at this product line. Uh, it's not how the entire piece works, it's just how we work. We are a team of about 20 people. Uh, we're going to be telling all about the tech we use, why we use it, how we use it, a lot about how we work. I'm not going to tell anything about the type of applications we're building and what they're used for and how they are used. Uh, uh, because some of this information is classified or we don't want to talk about this too much because it's into the police business. But we try to be uh, as open as possible about uh, technology and methodology. So let's start with methodology and culture. Uh, so as I said, we have three teams. Um, one team is called the core team, C-O-R-E, which uh, stands for Critical Operation and Reliability Engineering, which is an awesome abbreviation which we kind of stole from the guys at Netflix. Uh, then we have two we have common product teams, which are kind of development teams. One team focuses on the um, author side of things, so the uh, stuff that happens in the browser and from facing REST services. The other team focuses on the backend side of things, so uh, connectors that fetch stuff from the internet, big data processing jobs. Is this an ideal split? Uh, not really. We'd like to move to a more product-based team. So you have three teams um, that are each responsible, entirely responsible for a single product, but have all the knowledge and expertise 
they need to do everything they need in trying to develop this project but also keep it going in progression. So probably we'll have uh, some kind of a core team in the future. Uh, they will only be focusing on how to cloud and the solutions we're offering from our cloud. So they're kind of a platform team, but they want the operational responsibility for product security. <laughs> So we, um, um, we do Scrum, we have sprints of two weeks, and uh, we do an overall planning with all three teams at the start of the to see if there are differences between teams, typically um, when we uh, want to develop a new uh, visualization on the front side of things, we need some data, and we need to run a database somewhere, so typically there are some uh, differences between the teams. A fairly manual uh, planning ritual, and this is where um, uh, agile purists kind of uh, get a sour taste in their mouth when I talk about it. So what we do is we, we don't measure velocity or story points or anything like that. We uh, estimate stories, but only in the uh, amount of um, work we think is necessary to, uh, to build a story, uh, where we put a story point equal to one man day of work. So we estimate a story, we say, well, this is for, 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 one, for one person, two days of work. And at the, end, the beginning of the sprint, we count how, how much days have gone working, and then we fill the sprint until those numbers uh, add up. It's fairly uh, minimal, but it works kind of well for us. The only thing we want to take from this approach is that we have kind of predictability and how many stories can fit in a sprint. And we don't want to measure velocity and increasing velocity and stuff like that, because it's very simple to um, uh, to tweak those measures uh, and to, to misuse them and also to misread them. So we uh, do usability tests as part of our sprints. So we, we believe that our application is only as good as uh, how, how good our users think they are. So we, we put in users from different points of the, point of the field and uh, put them on a PC behind the latest version of the application and have them tested and get feedback from them and try to incorporate them what we're building at the moment. This really helps in uh, getting uh, getting applications out there that uh, users uh, are comfortable with working or, or have features that they, they like working. And for uh, our administration, we use Fabricator. I normally use Fabricator. It's a fairly unknown tool. It was, uh, it's kind of an, um, the open source equivalent of the Atlassian suite with the UN components and stuff like that. It was developed at Facebook. Uh, it's used by uh, Facebook, Dropbox, Pinterest, and that's all you need for HR project planning. There's uh, uh, sprint planning with uh, uh, Google, uh, uh, doing done links in there. There's a wiki in there. You can link to your version repository for a code review. You can make uh, mockups in there. So it's, it's a kind of an open source uh, project uh, support suite. It works, it works very well. So it's not really that well known, but uh, we like working with it. One of the reasons we're using it is that we uh, love to work with open source uh, software product products. We try not to invest in licenses and in products and in software, but try to invest in people. So culture. Um, we uh, are believers in the uh, philosophies of potential delivery and DevOps. Sure feedback loops. So whenever we do something, whatever we do, we want to have feedback as fast as possible. And this can be technical automated feedback. Whenever you push a change to version control, we want feedback from the build server within a few minutes. But also from our end users. Whenever we, uh, we build something, we want feedback from our end users. Is this feature working for you? And could we get to improve it as fast as possible? So this also helps in incorporating these usability tests in our sprints. Um, and also in terms of um, uh, feedback from, from users that, that come with new requirements. Uh, whenever we're building, sometimes during the sprint, we, we try to show what we're building and this is how you envisioned it. What can we do to make it even better? So feedback loops are important for us. And we try not to, to uh, be um, scared of uh, changing stuff, changing course while we're running. Uh, we reserve the right to wake up smarter every day. So whenever the next day we uh, decide that we should do something different than we did, than we did yesterday, uh, if time permits, we do it. We're not too afraid to uh, throw stuff away we've built before. We think we do something better and try to do it. <coughs> and this is vital for, for our speed uh, as a team. We try to minimize the dependencies we have outside our team, actually outside of our department, so outside our three teams. Because we can only influence uh, the speed of stuff that we're doing ourselves. If we have a uh, story in our sprint that um, uh, needs 
some work from someone outside the team. Uh, and he or she goes to the other side of the country, we can't go there and stand by his or her desk and push him or her to say, do it faster, we need it tomorrow. So we try to um, minimize the defense if you're outside of the team. And this, we can do this because we have most of the things we need to get an application out of production in our own apps. So from hardware to the workstations that our uh, customers work on, uh, we can do this all ourselves. This really helps in, uh, in keeping up the speed. And as I said before, we love open source, so we invest in people, in hiring good people, and not in web shared licenses. Um, so one thing about uh, about DevOps is uh, what I want to mention. So first, at this team, I really like so we have a concept we call uh, the um, DVDD and the OVDD. DVDD stands for uh, Developer van Dag, which is the kind of the dev tool of the day, and OVDD is Operator van Dag. And these people have um, a special role during the day in uh, handling all uh, operational stuff that, that, that boils up, but also proactively scanning our logs and our systems. Uh, are there any errors in there? Is that logging we need to improve? So uh, if you are the developer of the day, typically uh, take a look at our um, uh, logging uh, solution uh, a few times each day, see how many errors are occurring per service in production, is there something going wrong at the moment, is there something we should fix, how good is the logging, should we improve logging? Uh, not only in production, but also in development, because if you see log, log security in development, it's probably something you can fix before we put it into production. And we try to be open in what we do, by, for example, sharing how we work at public delivery meetups, uh, but also publishing some of the stuff we build on GitHub. So if you go to github.com slash policy, there, for example, the Jenkins to pipeline libraries we build are there, and some Angular to module visualization tools. Open, transparent, and verifiable. Serious our GitHub. Uh, <laughs> a screenshot of our GitHub repository. So let's talk uh, architecture. We have a few uh, architecture principles, and as a thing with principles, there are other things that you should do, or think you should do. We're not there yet, everywhere, but we try to strive to fulfill these principles. So the first one is end-to-end uh, -end security and encryption. From the browser of the user, all the way to the REST server, the Amazon the rest of the user, we want to be this encrypted all the way, uh, and want to be secure. We have a dedicated security model, so whenever a, uh, a browser calls a service and a service calls another service and a service calls another service, all these calls are done on behalf of the user. So everywhere we have, a, when a service receives a call, it's like the end user call it. And this helps in, in a security model because we don't need system accounts or call accounts and then um, program proprietary security solutions. Every call is to a service is as if the end user did it. So this very simplifies the uh, authorization model. Um, we put everything in version control, uh, code, uh, front end, uh, build pipelines, uh, open scripture, infrastructure, so we can easily roll something back or take a look at how, how we did things a year ago. Everything we build must be horizontally scalable, so that means that our applications are stateless, so it doesn't matter whether it serves one instance or four or six or eight, and we don't want to have single points of failure. So currently we have a few single points of failure uh, because we're running <coughs> with, with low balance source with multiple nodes behind it and the low balance are actually single points of failure. So we're now looking to remove these low balance source and move to a solution like service discovery so we can, we can fortunately scale out uh, a service uh, without having single points of failure. But as I said, these are principles so we're not actually there yet. Now dependencies on external sources. When uh, the Netherlands explode, we still want to be able to, to uh, uh, serve our users uh, in some way, obviously. But we don't want to be dependent on Google Maps, Google Maps for for web exclusions. It's okay uh, if our system uses uh, Google Maps, but then it's a secondary mapping resource. So everything we serve to our end users must be primarily available from our own data centers. We standardize on naming. So whenever you know the name and the environment of the service, you know the name of the Git project, you know the name of the server, you know the name of the call, uh, you know the URL, you know the name of the security token, because all these servers have a standardized name. And this really helps in being able to find your way to some of 50 or 80 components of the system. And this also helps in why we didn't really need um, uh, 
services company, yes, because everything is fairly predictable. You know, to reach a service and to say goodbye. So, just make sure to rename things that you realize later on they're playing wrong. Yeah, um, I, I was lucky enough to join uh, the team just after a, a giant rename project. Uh, that was a year ago, they're still talking about it. So, uh, yeah, we try to be very strict uh, in these naming conventions because it's the only way that we can easily find stuff throughout the landscape. Uh, our application configuration lives with uh, the, the application code. So we have uh, Git repositories where our Java code is in, and then the, the configuration of the applications or the property files live with this code. So we have, for example, three property files, one for dev, one for exception, one for production. Whenever you build, the properties get packaged with the code, and then we deploy it to our environments. Uh, <coughs> typically, these properties don't contain that much sensitive information. So whenever we need security keys to um, to communicate with our system, we make sure that the key, these keys are already on the system, and we can just reference them from the property files. So the configuration is with, with the code. When our security tool is involved, we make sure they're on the machine before the application is done. And uh, we're kind of fans of the, uh, the render design uh, principles, so we define our services by this feature. Whenever we need to uh, serve uh, I don't know, a, user, a user profile, we create a, we create a, a profile service. The sole purpose of this profile service is to serve user profiles. So when we split functionality in the services, we don't look at uh, the technical side of things, we look at the uh, domain side of things, the dictionary side of things. And this helps in getting those bits <coughs> between uh, different components in the landscape. So let's talk architecture. And this is a um, empty slide um, because in the speaker notes it says I need to warn you for a giant architecture diagram. So uh, here it goes. <laughs> Give you some time to soak this in. I assume there are no questions whatsoever. So let's, let's zoom in a bit because I'll help you guide through this uh, this argument. Um, it all starts with the platform we're running on. Uh, so we're running um, uh, machines that are in the police data center. Uh, and whenever a machine boots there, uh, we install uh, OpenStack on it and we have uh, Ceph. So OpenStack is a um, open source uh, cloud uh, solution. And Ceph is a distributed pick store. So uh, when a machine boots, uh, we give all the compute and memory resources to OpenStack and all the storage uh, to Ceph. And we can use OpenStack to roll out uh, VMs, uh, which obviously have compute, memory, and storage. So currently we're growing to somewhat like 500, well, 500 servers, 1500 VMs, and about 24 petabyte storage, that's 24,000 terabyte. So we're now about halfway there, so somewhat 250 servers. Um, and uh, these servers are running somewhere in the base data center. As soon as the server boots, it's ours. So we're going to provision it and we can install all the same ones. So uh, the architecture diagram starts with various uh, data sources. Uh, we pull data from the internet, from the Turk API. And uh, when we pull this data in, uh, we store all the uh, original data. So uh, the actual data we've downloaded, we store it on Ceph. And we hash it so uh, that we can always uh, verify that uh, the data we have is the original data we pulled from the internet. So we this passes through a machine uh, that stores all this, in, all this data on our distributed uh, data store. This data gets pulled in by uh, something we call connectors. A connector is typically a Spring Boot application that calls some API somewhere uh, to download, uh, download data, uh, for example, the tweets. And when uh, this data has been downloaded, um, the connector puts a message on uh, a Kafka topic. Kafka is a distributed uh, stream processor, or you could call a message queue or, or topic queue. It's something we put messages on. We have producers that put messages on, and consumers that leave messages on. So uh, whenever we download a document, we put it either on a, on a Kafka topic, or we uh, just put a message on the Kafka topic and uh, point it to the original store data on disk when it's too large to produce the entire data. We can 
um, we have at least once delivery for these Kafka messages, so we can uh, replay operations when necessary. For example, when we change something in the uh, data processing uh, side of things, we can um, take the original data and push it to Kafka again, so we can process it again. And, um, write the updated data in our data source. So we have, we do the stream processing, we used to do this with, uh, well I think we started out with Storm, then we moved to Apache Spark uh, on Hadoop a while ago, and then just, just a few weeks ago we did Spark and we moved to Kafka Streams. And Kafka Streams is uh, a framework where you can connect consumers to Kafka and then uh, uh, read messages from the Kafka queues and process it. So these are fairly simple stream applications. That pull messages from these uh, Kafka queues and then do something with it. And do something with it typically means do some processing and then write it in a uh, fast data store like uh, this search or example. So we have the, uh, the bulk of data we read from the internet where we do want to present to the user or combine it with example. Uh, we store the original data, when we read the data, we put it on the Kafka topic, and then our consumers that are reading this data, processing it, and running it in our fast data stores to make it available for the rest services. So we have Search, uh, Cassandra, MongoDB for some document-oriented stuff, and MySQL, because we migrated an old system to our system once, and that old system had MySQL and data store, and we didn't want to convert it, so we put it MySQL in place. And then there's uh, REST services that uh, read from the data stores and present to the end users. So, uh, in principle, every service has its own data store. Uh, in practice, it's, it's not really like that yet. Sometimes we, we have services that are kind of communicating to a data store, and which is then building is not really in microservices, but more a distributed model. So, we try to give every service its own data store so they're independent of each other. Uh, we're not really there yet. And there's the contents. Uh, we've, we've got a few front end applications that are built using Angular 2. We started working with Angular 2 a year ago and it was still fairly bad and it gave us some, uh, some play. But in the end, we're fairly happy with it. We'll talk some more about it later. Uh, and then there are the um, uh, end user devices um, and desktop, but also tablets and mobile devices that are used by end users. And uh, security and uh, application <coughs> management handled by uh, Kerberos for application. The Kerbal is kind of an old Windows single sign on solution that has, we have a Linux implementation on. So, whenever somebody logs in to you know, his, or, his or her workspace, um, then the machine requests Kerbal's ticket. And then the ticket is on the machine there in the operating system. Whenever you do a request to one of the backend services, this ticket gets sent with the request. We validate the ticket, then we have the user ID, then we ask the user details to LDAP, and then we know who the user is. Uh, so even though Kerbal is kind of old school, it works very well, uh, very well for us. So the uh, application handle by Kerberos, the uh, user information is fetched from Elba, so it's user ID, name, and role, and then all the fine-grained application-specific authorizations, we fetch those from uh, Cassandra. We had those in Elba before, but it turned out to be fairly slow. And so we moved to Cassandra, uh, our request uh, times went from return milliseconds to 20 or 30 or so, so that's quite a significant improvement. Because uh, we could create optimized um, stores in Cassandra for the for our authorization structure. So the platform we run on, we're kind of playing our own cloud provider, which is fun. Uh, it's, it's, it's different. Uh, the previous project I worked on, we were running on AWS, which is fun because you just put it to your credit card and you can launch machines and they're always running. So now we handle the cloud stuff ourselves. Um, we're providing general cloud service for the police organization, uh, besides the stuff that we're using ourselves. Uh, Ceft is a beautiful storage, Ceft is an open source storage uh, solution. We use public and Ansible for configuration management, so uh, almost everything we have is not be uh, provisioned. Uh, we manage around 3,000 desktops throughout the country. Uh, these are desktops that are used by users to connect to our services, so this also helps in terms of um, fairly limited amount of types of browsers we need to support, for example. And we need to set browser settings at the, uh, the workstations and resources. And uh, automation starts when the machine boots. So as soon as a, um, uh, a um, server boots somewhere in the police data center, uh, it boots over um, uh, PC or Ethernet, and then we provision it with, uh, with our cloud software. 
And when you're running some of the few on the servers, each server has 12 disks, then a disk fails every now and then. Uh, which that's not really an issue because all data is replicated three times to our customer. And whenever a disk fails, then set starts to be better seeing and spreading data over all our disks. But still, it's nice to replace those disks every now and then. So if we've, we're monitoring the state of our disks with uh, sort of smart and stuff like that. Whenever we detect that a disk is broken, we, um, a script kicks in that got some information about the system and then reports the ticket to the um, uh, ticketing system that are used by the people that <coughs> provide the remote hands in the data center. So they know to replace the disk. So it happens every now and then that our support phone uh, rings. We have one, one mobile phone that travels throughout the team with our support phone. Our support phone rings and there's one of the guys in the data center and I said, yeah, so you guys reported a broken disk. I'm here to replace it. Uh, so now in front of this machine, but there are 12 disks in here, and which is the broken one? <laughs> and then first, we kind of need to recover that, uh, uh, that we ultimately uh, created an issue to replace a disk. So, uh, okay, yeah, 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 sure. So what's the service tag of the machine? And uh, the guy reads out the service tag of the machine. Can we look it up in our administration system? We know the IP, we can log into it, see the smart values. Ah, yes, the, the second disk is broken. Yeah, but there are 12 disks in here. Is it the second disk from the top left or the second disk from the bottom right? Yeah, I'm pretty sure it's the second disk from the top left. So pull it out. The guy pulls it out. You see how the disk disappears. Oh, uh, no. No, put it back. Put it back. <laughs> and it's the second one from the, from the bottom right. Yeah, I'll replace it. And so um, uh, this is the technology we can run. Uh, quite a large amount of service without having to do that much manual labor on that, apart from the hardware service that needs to be done. So uh, sometimes memory boxes break and then uh, they need to be replaced. And it's all handled by people in the business. So we can actually go into a data center. So it's time to front end uh, a bit. I always imagine front end as the um, uh, the shiny car outside, while the, the backend guys are in the garage uh, getting their hands all greasy 